Welcome to part two of Back to the Blues with Robin Ford. Today we'll hear more from Robin's incredible trio, The Blue Line, featuring Tom Breckline on drums and Roscoe Beck on bass. Also, Robin talks about how to be more melodic using triads, good phrasing, and simplicity. He'll also demonstrate comping and soloing over a swing blues and a one chord blues vamp. In a special section devoted to right hand techniques, Robin shows how he uses his fingers as well as a pick for dynamics and expression. And we'll talk with Robin about his influences, guitars, stage setup, and how to get a good sound. Okay, so this is my third video for REH. Um, the, the first two I'll tell you a little bit about in case you haven't seen them. Um, first was kind of a beginning video. Uh, we talked about really basic things about harmony and uh, blues playing. Uh, the second video got a lot more adventurous and um, we uh, looked a lot more at a uh, broader harmonic spectrum uh, rhythms and uh, even playing through chord changes more in the past. So we have these two things, uh, the, the basic gr grassroots and then you know, quite an expansion which goes uh, beyond the, the, the basic blues uh, harmony and concepts. So in this video I'm hoping we can put these two things together uh, in a way that, um, well, uh, exemplifies, I guess, in particular what I'm doing right now with my group and my own personal style of guitar playing. So uh, we'll see if we can do that for you. But first, let me give you a note to tune up. We're going to play a B flat shuffle right now, and uh, basically I'll, I'll keep it simple in, in the front and play real straight ahead uh, blues guitar, and then as it develops, hopefully uh, I'll be able to uh, stretch it a little bit more and more and, and bring more of the altered chords into, into the playing. So here we go. Uh, one, two, uh, two, three.
the uh, little jam session we just had there um, is something that I've enjoyed doing for years. Uh, even the key of B flat it just seems like the, the swing in this key for an up-tempo up shuffle blues. Um, I don't know exactly why, but I just like that. And, um, you know, what we were doing there was mixing the, uh, the traditional blues style with uh, a, a real swing and uh, jazz approach as well, uh, using uh, altered chords, one, six, two, five chord changes in there. So, uh, you know, these two worlds have never seemed really far apart to me. They're virtually synonymous as far as I'm concerned, uh, blues playing and jazz playing. And for me, again, that even that works in, in just about any musical context. It's always the same. Where you're coming from is uh, one place. It's you and your instrument, and, and you're making music the best way you know how. Um, to put those two things together, blues and jazz, it's, it's just not that big of a leap uh, on an emotional or even stylistic level to me. So uh, I feel very at home. Uh, in either uh, medium as far as the groove is concerned and I've learned enough about the chords to have some idea how to play through those those chord changes. I, um, I have a tendency to start playing the altered tones when we get to that uh, six chord. Okay, B flat. I'll play pretty much straight ahead through all that. And now when we get here, on the sixth chord, I'll start, uh, I'll, I'll play the sixth chord, the altered sixth chord, and, and nine times out of ten, I like playing that particular voicing, which is the diminished scale. You got your two chord, which could be either C minor or C7, C9, to the, to the five chord. Perfect opportunity for a two five, you know. There are some real uh, essential things that uh, I'd like to talk about here uh, that really make all the difference in the world. It's like the, uh, the, the open secret aspects of music. It's like, um, it's not really a big deal, but uh, it seems to elude people in some ways, which is uh, how you actually make music, you know. Um, for me, uh, I don't play too many licks, what people call licks. Uh, I never sat down and actually learned a bunch of licks or took licks off records, like, you know, write, writing them out, transcribing, whatever like that. Uh, for me, music's always been just a real audio experience. It's something that, you know, you listen to music. Music is something that comes into your ears from the air. It's created by other people, but it's... Uh, it's, it's intangible in itself. And that which inspires music also is intangible. Um, it's the, uh, you know, the emotional aspect of it. Um, music uh, in its central uh, aspect uh, is basically folk music, you know? It's uh, music that comes from people, people's experiences, uh, you know, people's joys, sadnesses, whatever, you know? The, the aspect of it being music, uh, you have to really attach the technical aspects of playing or of music uh, to, you know, your emotions. Uh, music is just like language. Like, you learned how to speak by hearing and practicing all the time. And you had a great need to learn how to speak because everyone else was speaking around you. 
and uh, you know you you had to learn how to speak it was that important to you so I kind of see music as the same way it's it comes from that kind of a need to communicate um, everybody gets very excited by people who are amazing wizards on an instrument um, but it only goes so far you know and what's really uh, important is that you're saying something uh, as opposed to just playing something so for me I hear what I'm playing it's as melody it's not licks there's a little bit of that in there but um, one of the reasons I'm drawn more and more to the blues all the time is because it's such a vocal music and uh, the blues guitar players are playing the guitar from the same place that a blues singer is singing They're, it's identical there's no difference the medium is, is different but the emotion the intent all of those things are the same that's why blues guitar is kind of simple because it's it's coming from a vocal place uh, you keep that and go out from there into more sophisticated music forms jazz uh, classical music and what um, what ties those those things together the emotion and the sophistication of these uh, you know more um, complex musical forms or whatever uh, is melody uh, it's a song so you're actually it's a singing thing you know it's the beauty of the melody or um, um, I mean you know jazz obviously harmony became very important and technique has always been very important as well but nonetheless the thing that makes it really work is if there's some kind of heartfelt uh, melodic quality to it I've always liked the melody players in jazz guitar my favorite guitarist is Jim Hall and he is um, probably the simplest of all of those guitarists um, and I say simple in that there's a lot of space in his music and the way he plays and it's pretty when he plays um, Miles Davis as a trumpet player he was able to you know do whatever he, he was able to play the shit out of the trumpet and uh, it came up you know working with Charlie Parker who was uh, probably the most incredible improviser of all time but uh, he was always drawn towards simplicity and melody always drawn towards it you know he wanted to be able to hear it to be able to sing it to be able to feel it and uh, that's the blues that's that's how it's attached to the blues and he did a record called kind of blue which many of you may know but I would consider it essential listening uh, in this respect of simplicity in the forms brilliant you know uh, music musicality uh, very sophisticated but real simple and um, also uh, Coltrane's John Coltrane's album ballads I would recommend people to listen to for the most part he just plays the melody but you've never heard the melody played you know more beautifully and it's such a, a singing quality in the way he plays um, the composer uh, Maurice Ravel uh, I am a big fan of and uh, in particular for me there's a, a wonderful piece of music called the mother goose suite which uh, is just full of all these wonderful melodies you know and um, Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring another example of just a lot of wonderful melodies it, it, it's all drawn from folk music and um, you know these things are just they're so heartfelt you know and, and so pretty beautiful and uh, emotional um, you need to expose yourself to things like that music like that music that actually is you know coming from that place and there's plenty of it on the rawest levels you know John Lee Hooker or uh, you know the real funky blues all the way to you know Igor Stravinsky uh, not necessarily the most emotional composer of all time but um, people like Ravel and Debussy and uh, you want to listen to that you want to listen to that so you uh, you know you have a nice round musical experience that's coming from the place of a love of music and uh, some kind of beauty and uh, and joy and you know real good human experiences and emotions
So let me show you some, uh, some possibilities um, with basically a single seventh chord. We, we played this little rhythm thing in, in G. So uh, I'll start from real simple ones to maybe a little bit more um, interesting ones, or harmonically interesting ones, shall we say. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a G7. And we got that little hammer thing in the third which gives it some kind of movement and it's not just a stagnant. So there you go. Now if anybody tells you that's not cool music, they got a hole in their soul, you know what I mean? And uh, th there was a time when I used to, th I really got away from these chords. I wanted to learn all these hip chords. And um, I, I couldn't believe that people were still even interested in playing a major triad, you know. So uh, over the course of time and, and being affiliated with some musicians who were, had, had already been through the, the chord and harmo harmony school, uh, I relearned, you know, the beauty of, of these simple things, you know. So there you go. That's a nice one. Just that G7 chord. 
Okay, now we can just take it right on up the, uh, the, uh, the ladder here to this G7 chord. Okay, now that was first, we had the tonic on top, now we have the third on top, that's how the chord's built, tonic third, fifth. Now you have the next one is the seventh, tonic third, fifth, seventh. Uh, this is a pretty funky voicing here, right? You might prefer to hear like a nine chord, G9, or uh, this one right here. So. Okay. Now there's some simple, just seventh chord voicings. Um, okay, we could also play this nine chord. Okay, G9. Now, we can play this uh, D minor, basically, is a, becomes G9. And there's a nice little hammer-on thing you can do. So I'm basically playing an A minor 7, and then a D minor over G. Then you have your basic G9 chord, and uh, I think the f uh, I had a friend uh, who was uh, the son of the people who uh, owned the local record store in town. He played guitar. He had a Martin acoustic, and I'd never seen anything like that, you know, at the time. He showed me how to play a nine chord, and he used to play it this way, with the fifth in the root. Now, I never cared for that too much because I don't like doubling notes. There's just never seen any point. If you played the note once, I don't really want to hear it again, you know? So you can play that, but that's the way I played a nine chord. And basically now I've narrowed it down to just, just those notes because I'm all, I invariably am playing with a bass player and he's got that. So he's already got that and I don't need to play it. So there's a nine chord. In fact, I usually play it this way because it enables me to get other places a little easier. That was a nine chord there. There's a nine chord there, G7. So you got There's a bunch of nine chords for you. We're going to do something now, uh, exercising the wah-wah pedal a little bit. Uh, it's uh, a wonderful little device. It was very big, uh, I think, during the late 60s and early 70s and kind of vanished for a while as passe. But uh, it's a great thing if you're not into a lot of effects, particularly uh, in your, uh, your setup and everything. Wah-wah pedal is just a great little color that I've, I've grown very fond of using once again. So uh, we're going to just play this one, one chord jamaroonie here. And uh, keep your eyes on the, on the chordal work in particular, because uh, I think that's the, the, the more interesting part of what we're going to do here. What I'm going to do here, anyway. What they do is always interesting. Ready? One, two, three, four. <laughs>
I've noticed some changes in the in the setting here. We're in Los Angeles, California, right now, as opposed to uh, Seattle. Um, I had thought about what we'd shot up there and, and decided I wanted to add a few things, um, mainly um, some uh, a little bit more technical aspects of uh, guitar playing, and in particular uh, the use of triads in the blues and also fingering techniques. Uh, mainly right hand is what I want to put the accent on here, but um, I'm going to show you a few uses of some triads in an A blues. So I want to show you one little thing here, uh, a C major triad against A. Right there, you've got a C major triad, third, fifth, and tonic. And uh, when adding a little kind of left-handed hammer on here to that major third, you've got a nice little little blues lick there. And um, putting on top of that an, an A minor triad. expanded the lick here. And um, again, uh, bringing in the C major triad an octave above and played slightly differently. I'm just playing sliding up to the fifth of, uh, or the third of a C major. And uh, just dragging my finger across it here. And that's the same thing, an octave down. Okay, now if we were playing a slow blues, for instance, key of A, there's that C major triad. Mm. Okay, now right there, that was using the D major triad. moving into the four chord. Same fingering as the uh, previous one, the C major against A. You can play it with the same fingering, or I sometimes use this fingering. Using my little finger, and it might be kind of hard to see because I keep these fingers so close together, but I'm using the little finger in the first one. And then playing the seventh of the D chord. there for the E, I just basically spelled uh, an E chord. Third, fifth, the sixth, and then the tonic. So I'm play basically playing an E major six there. Mm. 
once again the D. Okay, so um, that is a real, uh, something I use a, a lot in my playing, especially the more time I have, for instance, in a slow blues, is just using the triad. To get from one lick to another. That's just playing an A major triad, right? And then playing the minor third above it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about right hand uh, technique right now. Um, as you can see, even at this very moment, I'm holding the pick between these two fingers. Um, I don't know how it got there because I never thought about how it got there, but um, somehow it's just, I just, I'm holding the pick, for instance, and slip it in between the two fingers. And um, I used to drop more picks than I do now, but I, I finally learned how to hang on to the thing, but it just stays right there. And um, we've discussed this in, in previous videos, but I thought I might add a little bit to it here. Um, you know, mainly, the, uh, the technique is to hit the string with the finger closest to it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, but I also find that my middle finger does a great deal of the, um, the single note work. It kind of acts, uh, that and the thumb for the lower strings, it, it acts as, as the pick more than uh, the first finger, for instance. And the thumb will come into play whenever, basically on the, um, the lower three strings for the most part. play an entire lick, basically just using the thumb. I've never been very good about using these two fingers together. Now this could be considered a slow technique. I mean, if you're basically just using one finger to play uh, several notes, you can't do it too fast, but uh, you're you can surprise yourself sometimes. 
Uh, I'm not necessarily recommending that you play it this way either. Uh, this technique developed very um, sort of naturally for me without a lot of thought and just a lot of consistently putting my pick away and just playing. There will never be any substitute for that. So uh, you might discover your own techniques as well. So um, when I was showing you those triads at, at, in the beginning, to play that one right there, the right hand, the thumb pulls that uh, low, low E there. So it's just one, two, three. First and uh, second fingers, always used for the double stops. And then the thumb will play the single string. Or the middle finger for me will play the high string. talk a little bit about um, picking technique. Um, there's a lot of different approaches to it. Uh, you know, downstrokes, upstrokes, pull-offs, which is um, avoiding using your pick for something. Um, I use the butt into the pick as opposed to the tip for, for the most part. Uh, the pick for me acts uh, very similarly to the thumb, basically when using both pick and fingers to play at the same time. But it brings in uh, another possibility, which is a strong backstroke. Now, uh, often, I'll use the pick very deliberately uh, using only downstrokes. And uh, I say deliberately because uh, it's just that. They're the only way I can get the kind of sound that I want for something, which is um, a kind of a, a pushy kind of a thing. It's also, it's like kind of bad technique, but it's the only way you can get that thing. Now, if you play it very precisely, it doesn't have the same effect, you know? So, um, this is what I like to think of as kind of using bad technique for, for good purposes. So you don't have to be afraid of that. It's, it's actually kind of uh, fun. A certain amount of abandon in there and tossing technique out the window and just going for much more of an emotional expression, which uh, is kind of crude in a way, but, um, you know, we, we have these qualities within us. And in fact, they're uh, a lot of fun to play with, you know? That's a, that's a big part of, of what blues is. So... Um, I'll, I'll try to demonstrate a, a little bit of my picking technique for you uh, in a slow blues, using the pick. are things that happen 
when you play, if you actually let your emotions sort of carry you, um, requires a certain amount of you know courage and going out on a limb, as opposed to you know having your technique all together per se. Um, and uh, a lot of it, uh, it's just these little subtle little things. Like for instance, the way you you, you might play with the pick, and it's actually. Um, something that uh, I think comes from experience. You know, the more and more you play, uh, and particularly the more and more you play in front of an audience, that's the way you're going to discover these things, you know? Uh, because it's an emotional issue. It's not, um, or it's, a, it's, a, it's an object of feeling as opposed to a technique. Uh, it sounds different when you play the, with the pick. I'm kind of using the whole a flat part of the pick here to uh, get a, a little softer, lighter thing. Um, double stops is a very effective thing in the blues. And once again, I, I like to use them. I use them a lot of different ways, but uh, using them in that kind of abandoned way, you know, with kind of a lot of down strokes. favorites is uh, what happens here. It's like uh, here's an A octave, right? A on the D string, A on the B string, and you've got uh, the this basically uh, minor pentatonic with the flatted fifth included. And uh, also, just using uh, uh, the fifth intervals, right, the fifth here, the tonic here, and then basically just moving them in the pentatonic scale. We're going to do a tune now, which many of you may know. This is a classic for us. It's called Talk to Your Daughter.
for me, the reason, probably the greatest reason that I have really gone more back toward the blues has been the sheer fact, the mere fact that I play an electric guitar. And the electric guitar has never fit into jazz for me. It's just, you know, like um, the great jazz guitarists, uh, there have been many, you know. But I never went after it because I, I found that the sound was kind of monotonous. You know, most people play with that same tone, bass pickup, kind of fat sound, you know. And there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, tonal variation or a lot of nuance. So tone and nuance is something a guitar is full of. But you hear it in the blues. You don't hear it in jazz, you know. So um, then for the harmony, chord changes and all of that, I listen to saxophone players. Let's talk about getting a good sound. People have different uh, predilections for instruments and amplifiers. And uh, truly, there is a lot of stuff out there that affects your sound, or can affect your sound, that you can use to, to create a sound. Uh, I'd like to stress that the most important aspect of your sound is going to be your concept of sound, which really boils down to what sounds good to you. 
what sounds good to you? Um, and basically, your body, meaning uh, in particular your fingers, to, to, and how you touch the instrument, how you play the instrument, that's what sound is really about. So please don't forget that. And don't think that sound is out there somewhere. And if you plug in the right gizmos, you're going to get the sound you want. Because that's not it. It, it, it really comes from um, inside. My first real nice six string uh, was a, a Guild um, Starfire or Firebird or something. Single cutaway. A little red two pick, double pickup Guild, you know. And um, I bought it because when I checked it out in the music store, it sounded like Mike Bloomfield to me. It sounded like his telly did on that uh, uh, first Butterfield record. I don't know why, uh, it, but somehow it made it for me. You know, it was like, that's the sound, you know. So, um, and that was based on a telly, man, come to think of it. And then, you know, of course, he, was, he went to the Les Paul pretty quickly thereafter, but, you know, I just seemed to be able to do whatever I needed to do out of this guild, you know. And then when I got interested in jazz, which was later on, I mean, I got the, uh, an L5 when I was uh, working with, um, I, guess, I think, yeah, with Charlie Musselwhite. So I was like 19, and, uh, and I, uh, I bought an L5. And then uh, about two years later with Jimmy Witherspoon, I traded it on a Super 400. And that was because I want to play jazz. I need a jazz guitar. So I got, that looks like a jazz guitar. And then I went to a, a 335 a little while later on because uh, I went, I was living in, uh, Sa up around San Francisco. I had to come to LA to do a gig and I forgot to bring my guitar. So, shit, I needed a guitar. And I was playing with the LA Express, so I, you know, and Joni Mitchell, so I had some money and I didn't really think about it too much, you know. I went downtown to buy a guitar, you know. We went into Guitar Center on Sunset Boulevard, and uh, they had a 335 on the wall, and I said, that looks good. I checked it out, I said, okay, I'll take this. <laughs> well, this is Old Faithful. I've been playing this guitar since about 1983, or so, maybe four. Yeah. And um, it was uh, something that Dan Smith, who... Uh, at the time I met him was with Yamaha, but we were talking about a guitar, you know, smaller body, two, you know, double cutaway humbuckers. You know, he wanted to do something that married um, the Strat and, and a jazz guitar or a humbucking guitar, Gibson style. I mean, this guitar doesn't do that. That was their intention. I just wanted something, you know, that was smaller than a 335 because I just got tired of that big old thing. And I don't wear my guitar low. I like it kind of high. So, um, between, you know, like, he just, he went with it. He and John Carruthers um, designed this guitar for Fender. And uh, here it is. I mean, this is it. I've changed the pickups. The pickups they made then were no good. Now they're good. They actually have good pickups in them. Is it hollow? They have some hollow. Little cavities. Solid, hollow, solid, little hollow there. And, of course, it's hollow here for that. Um, people... Uh, need to feel free about um, messing with their guitars, you know. Very important. I mean, I don't know how to do it myself, but uh, I've, you know, found somebody that I like to do it for me when I need it. And, uh, you know, pickups are easily changed these days. And, you know, people should experiment. If they don't dig their sound, they should experiment with it. I like a bigger bridge. That's a Nashville, Gibson Nashville bridge. That isn't what originally was on this guitar. I like it. Simple change to do. Also, I have my tone and volume controls disconnected right now in this guitar. Or just, you know, they, nothing happening there. So I have to rely on the volume pedal, obviously, for that. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm going to stay that way, but I have been playing like this for at least a year. So, you know, you can, you can make a change like that, and you can always go back. You know, so people should feel free to check it out, you know, mess around with it. Strings. I use uh, Di, uh, Diodario Tense. My little setup back here is not too complex at all. Um, the, the main thing here is the uh, Dumble Overdrive Special Amplifier. And uh, I, in, 
fully uh, believe in these amps. I've never found anything for me that compares to them. Uh, but I can tell you they're very expensive and they're very hard to get. And uh, the good news is that they're based basically on a Fender Twin. Uh, that would be my second amp of choice, would be, would be the Fender Twins. So um, I'm using a Marshall 412 cabinet here. Speakers, you, I'm using I have the probably Celestins in there. This is the speakers are rental. Um, but uh, you might prefer EVs or Altec Lansings or uh, JBL, you know. Uh, so speakers are also very important to the kind of sound you're going to get. If you're not getting the sound you want, you may just want to change your speakers. So don't forget that. Each little thing is, is important to your sound. I use uh, this little twin over here. It's also a rental, but I do the same uh, myself whenever I'm overseas. We pick up a, a twin, and I use it just to broaden the sound that I have. Um, the one amplifier and, and 412 speaker system is the, the main thing, and this just spreads the sound out a little bit for me, make it a little bit bigger. Uh, I get to it from here. This is the TC Electronics 2290. I use it for chorus and uh, delay. Uh, and I come out of the, the right side of the TC into this the twin over here. That's how the signal gets there. Um, I'm using a PCM70 Reverb Lexicon. And uh, these are, one is an extra. This is the Dumbelator, which is made by Alexander Dumble, and it's the effects loop for the Dumble amplifier. It just enables the amp and the outboard gear to interface properly. Uh, without the Dumbelator and the Dumble, uh, the Dumble amp and these effects wouldn't work anywhere near as well. Uh, this stuff is pretty expensive gear. Uh, the amp head, the TC, and, and the PCM. Uh, but you don't necessarily need that, you know. Um, I truly believe that with uh, one or two good Fender Twins, I'm not trying to advertise here, by the way, but for the kind of sound that I like and a blues sound, I've seen every blues guitar player, I mean, B.B. King, uh, I can't say everyone, but B.B. Uh, King and Albert Collins, who are probably my favorites, both use Fender Twins a lot. Um... So I'd, I would recommend checking them out. And uh, also, the little TC Electronics uh, Stereo Chorus, this little foot model, goes on the floor, uh, is a good little chorus box. So you got a nice chorus in that, nice reverb and, and amps in the twin reverbs. Um, beyond that, you might want a little delay. And that's basically all I use, reverb, a little, a little uh, chorusing, and a, a little delay and I try to use them sparingly. And the twins have an overdrive station in them, so that's what I have with the Dumble. It's got an overdrive station in it, and that's how I get my overdrive tone. Clean setting and then an overdrive. And uh, beyond that, I use uh, uh, Ernie Ball volume pedal uh, to you know, control my, my volume level. Uh, and I use uh, an old Crybaby uh, wah-wah pedal. This next song is from the Robin Ford and the Blue Line album, our first solo album uh, as a band. It's uh, called You Cut Me to the Bone. Nobody knows when it all began This kind of trouble between a woman and a man You know the nature of a love remains Tell me you never want to feel that way again And I seem to be at the heart of all your problem You cut me to the bone Baby, you cut me to the bone You know how to make a man feel alone You cut me to the bone You've gone a long way from loving me now you're leaving me in misery Forget about it all that we've been through You're gonna do the things you wanna do And you don't wanna hear The single word I'm saying Cut me to the bone Baby, you cut me to the 
Well, um, definitely my, my first real guitar inspiration was Michael Bloomfield uh, with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. It was the first blues I ever heard in my life, really, you know, that I went, you know, was struck by this music. And uh, it was the first real, you know, especially at that time, guitar virtuoso that I ever heard. The guy was playing so much more than anybody else, and prior to that, all I'd ever heard was... Uh, you know, uh, Keith Richards and George Harrison, you know, not to, to belittle them, but this guy was playing the shit out of the guitar. So, um, bam, you know, I got hooked at, at that moment. And I'd been noodling on the guitar, but I was still kind of playing saxophone and, and everything and singing with my, my group. But once I heard that, it was just, you know, like a world opened up for me, you know. And uh, I was... Um, 
you know, two hours north of San Francisco, and the whole scene was busting loose in San Francisco with all those San Francisco bands. I mean, the Grateful Dead, Big Brother, and the Holding Company, and all of those. But also, Paul Butterfield was coming through town and might even have been living there. Uh, Mike Bloomfield started his band, The Electric Flag. Albert King, B.B. King, they were all playing there. And so I used to go see him play, you know. B.B. King was a revelation, absolutely. He was like the second revelation. First it was Mike Bloomfield. Then I saw B.B. King live because I went to see The Electric Flag, which was Mike Bloomfield's band. And B.B. King opened the show, you know. No, he didn't. I, well, I don't remember if he opened it or, or closed it, but uh, he came out there, and I had no idea what I was going to hear, and it was B.B. King. I mean, he may as well have been at the Apollo Theater. I mean, he was giving it up, man. And, you know, how old was he at the time? He was uh, maybe 35 maybe 35, something like that. So he's in his prime. And it was just amazing, man. He was just so much heart and soul and sounding great and his band's cooking. We were, we were dying, you know. My brothers and I was just like, this is it. I've died and gone to heaven, man, you know. And uh, so, of course, we got the first B.B. King record we could get our hands on, which was which live at the Apollo. And it sounded just like it. It sounded just like when we saw him, man. And... Um, so then Albert King, you know, and of course Eric Clapton, uh, I'd heard with uh, John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, and he's still probably my favorite Clapton guitar work, um, and um, Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix. I always like to say that everything you ever heard about Miles Davis was true. I mean, that, that really says, kind of says it all for me in a, in a nutshell. Um, the thing about the guy, he was tremendously challenging on both a personal and a musical level. And uh, he was always challenging you to be there fully, you know. Can you hang in this situation? And I figured that out really quick because he's so intimidating, you know. I mean, like... He'd come, you know, walking towards you with his little trumpet, you know, and he's a very dark person, and he wears shades like this, and all these wild clothes, you know. He looked like Darth Vader or something, you know. It's like the Force is coming at you. So he was an intimidating person, but man, he was always ready to, to play, you know, kind of spar or whatever. So um, I figured it out quick, because otherwise, you know, you, 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 it's sink or swim. And there were guys, you know, who went through that band who kind of treaded water, you know. And that, you can't do that, you know. <laughs> that's, I don't know, that's no fun. Yeah. So, you know, just the, whenever he would challenge me, I would come up to it, you know, even if I was kind of scared because, you know, he's scary. <laughs> but, but very funny. Great sense of humor. And, uh, you know, just always kind of poking you and playing with you, you know. Or... Uh, really intimidating at times and I just you know wouldn't wouldn't buy into it you know and he dug that man and, and within five concerts that I played with them he was just completely civil and he'd call me on the telephone we'd talk you know and it was amazing suddenly it's Miles Davis and you were talking on the phone you know well um, when I first the very first show that I played with him uh, I felt like he probably wanted to hear Mike Stern or John Schofield, you know. So I, uh, I was really trying to play a lot of notes and really going for a lot of harmonic adventure. And basically I wound up tied in knots and uh, feeling really uptight because I wasn't just doing my thing, you know. So, and, and that quick, I mean, it was like I knew the next day, it's like, just be yourself or you're not going to make it here, you know. So I just went out and I just did my thing. I played with my fingers, played a lot of blues, you know. And um, having not gotten quite as far away from playing more harmonically adventurous music at that time, it was, it was easy for me to fall into it, you know. M it was mostly one chord. I mean, the, the music that we played, I, I soloed on one chord 95% of the time, you know. So uh, that chord was basically, you know, potentially a 12-tone row. I mean, you know, it was like, it seemed that any note you played worked if you played it the right way. So I fooled with it. And just, I mean, like the, the, uh, the tremendous thrust of being on stage with him, 
uh, you know, he was making you play. That's the way it felt. Like, you know, you've got to play. <laughs> so you'd just go for it, you know. And you, you only knew that your solo was over when he started playing trumpet again. Then you stop, <laughs> you know. So in a sense, it was kind of difficult to actually build anything from the ground up because you always felt like, I've got to be playing my ass off right now, mm -hmm. you know. That's like my favorite part. Like the thing I, I'm, I learned from Miles Davis was the beauty of simplicity, you know. I mean, the combination of him and people like B.B. King and Albert King, where it's, it's all soul and touch and tone, you know. That's what the blues is all about. And, um, you know, Miles, who went through that whole school of bebop, et cetera, and, you know, and, you know, beyond, uh, to me became the greatest example of a guy who knew harmony inside and out, but didn't spend his days exercising it all the time, you know. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's the whole fun of it, you know, to me, to be in a, in a blues band where I can do that, you know. You know, he kept his music simple. Miles' music was, it, it sounded complex in a lot of ways, but man, he kept it simple. So, uh, that's kind of what we do in this group. We keep it simple, but the door is always open to, you know, um, altered chords, really. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... In that sense, we're a jazz band, you know. So, once again, I want to say thank you, uh, in particular to Roger Hutchinson and uh, CPP Belwin for making this video happen, and my good friend Don Muck, who is always completely invaluable in making these things. Uh, I hope that I've given you something a little newer, uh, a little fresher here. Um, and, uh, you know, once again, we'd just like to encourage you uh, to get into the basics of music, you know? Get into the real fundamental things about music, which for me boils down to the blues because that's where all the other music that ever came out of America came from, aside from the obvious European influences of classical music. Um, and uh, not to worry too much about having really expensive gear and uh, think more about how you're playing it, and how you're hearing it, and what it is that you want to say. So remember, it's music we're talking about, and uh, not just technique, uh, chops, whatever you want to call it. So good luck, and uh, I'm sure we'll see each other again. <laughs>